Hi guys! Hello! Welcome fellow freaks, geeks, and nostalgic 90s nerds to my channel, Slime and Slashers, where, yeah, we talk about everything from Nickelodeon Slime to horror movie slashers, but today we're talking King Cujo. and Cujo. <laughs> Cujo, King, both things are being discussed today, because yes, I'm joined by my friend Kat for our Hello. monthly year of King. I know. So this is a reading project, if you guys are not familiar, that we've been doing all year long, and it's been a lot of fun. It has been a lot of fun, and it's getting close to the end. It is! We're in the eighth <laughs> month, so this is the eighth King book or story we've read this year, and we've watched the adaptations, and the project is, each month we discuss the book versus the movie mm -hmm. or movies, or the book or story versus the show. You know, we haven't had a show so far, a TV show. No, because one, we didn't, we didn't do the Castle Rock. And we didn't do the Mist. So and Castle Rock would have been for Misery. Because right. Misery is heavily covered in Castle right. Rock. And Mist was very difficult to be able to watch it. I feel like we couldn't find, there's a Mist TV show, guys. Yes. That's what we're referring to. And mm -hmm. we read the Mist, but, uh, and we watched the movie, the Mist, but we could not find the mm -hmm. TV show that apparently exists. And we've got people joining us. Yay. Katrina! <gasps> hey, Katrina! And Kelly and Arlene and Cool Gamer. Hey, Katrina. Oh, yes. And Arlene is from Manchester. I yeah. love that she watches all the way from England. Oh, and she's got a Guinness and cider mixture. Oh, wow. Wow. So I've got, I've got some Guinness in the fridge. And Paul, <laughs> my boyfriend, keeps complaining that I have not. I'm not usually a stout fan, but I did drink Guinness at the Guinness factory, but my boyfriend keeps complaining that I have not drunk the Guinness. We, we got some for a recipe and I have not drank the rest. So <laughs> use one for the recipe and we've got five beers oh, in the fridge. We should have gotten a single, but they didn't have a single. So anyway, oh, well. enjoy your Guinness because yes. I need to drink mine. But now I've got, guys, fall beers. Paul just bought me a freaking 12 pack of Sam Adams Oktoberfest. I live for pumpkin beer and Oktoberfest beer. And they're starting to be stocked in stores. Yes, because the autumn season <gasps> autumn. is around the corner. So we are going to be talking King, but I do want to do a sidebar and just let you guys know, Kat and I just filmed before we started streaming, we filmed a, a Halloween haul. Yes. So I'm very excited. I hope you guys will check it out. It will be edited and up later this week. So I it can't was wait. Fun. A lot of a lot of giggling. Yes, tons of giggling. <laughs> and by the way, Kelly is here. She said, I did not read the book, but I've seen the movie. And we do have a lot of great tidbits about the, the movie. movie. Kelly, are you giving up on King? This will not be good for you to hear. Oh, but no, um I'm not listening. <laughs> Kelly, no. uh it's too wordy for her. King's oh. writing. So I understand. Kelly really likes plot driven books oh, versus and, character yes. driven. And I have to admit that Stephen King, I think you realize in that Stephen King is more character driven. He is. And I, I sometimes like it, but I do, even I struggle a little bit. I love King. <laughs> but I do struggle sometimes. Not with Cujo, though. I will talk more about Cujo. But Kelly, oh, yes. do you even plan to read Cujo at any point? Oh, my God. Because she's, she kind of has sworn off. Can't, I was going to say, I was going to say, if there is a book to read, I would say Cujo is one because it makes you watch the movie. You appreciate the movie a little bit differently. Yeah. I'm just going to say. And also, too, for me, and I hope you agree with this, um, is Cujo seemed to be like a literary gem. It's underrated, but it was like so much literary. It was like, like, not like it was just a horror book. It was just beautifully written. And there were so many deeper meanings. Okay. It's almost like when we decided that Pet Cemetery was almost like a book more about grief. Oh, yes. Okay. Then the horror. This was a book that had deeper meaning to yes. it than uh, like really and truly yes. the fact that they, he named it Cujo is mind boggling to me because it's really not about Cujo. In no, my opinion. it's about the family and their struggles and their fear of different things. In fact, the documentary you watched about mm -hmm. the movie discusses a little bit of the themes in the book and the movie, you know, for D Wallace's character in the movie, like, 
she is scared in, in the book it's represented too scared of getting old scared of letting right. life pass by scared of just being a, a house mom the the dad is scared in the book Cujo and in the film scared of losing his account and not having enough money to support his family and then the kid is scared of a monster in his closet exactly which is different in the book and the so you're movie. talking about real fears and imaginary fears and i, I I just, the thing about the movie, and I, I saw the movie way before I read the book. Me too. And this is the first time reading the book. I always just kind of thought, well, what's the point of reading the book? I've seen the movie. I and thought it's that about too. this dog. And, and to me, the dog was terrifying. Everything was terrifying in it. So I just couldn't imagine what like more could the book say? Reading a story about this, you the know, book, rabid dog. You know, or the dog jumps on the window. So I will tell you guys, I was so surprised by this book. Going into this book, this is how I felt. So going into this book, I, I thought to myself, I'm not looking forward to this book. This is the least like excited I am for any of our picks. She didn't tell me that. No, I didn't tell Kat because she had picked out the books and I was like, okay, Cujo, whatever. Like it would be fun to compare it to the movie because I've seen the movie, but like I, the idea of going into Cujo, I was like, I know the story. I'm not excited at all. It surprised me. It yes. is in my top favorites. Yes. It's, I never thought I would go in, going into Cujo. I never thought I would come out of the book and be like, this is one of my favorite Stephen King books. I never in a million so years good. would have guessed that. So good. And honestly, I'm just going to say, it was so sad. Like I cried. I cried. I teared up. And at then the end. when um like I was thinking, oh my gosh, now I'm gonna watch the movie again. I saw the movie with totally different eyes. And there's so much that's left out in the movie. And I guess it's only what they could do with the time that they had. But they leave out so much. Yeah. There's so much in it. And I can't wait to talk about the, the book aspect of it. I can't wait to talk about the book versus the movie and the movie in general. Because the movie was never my favorite King adaptation movie either. Even though I love Dee Wallace. And I love... And I was telling Kat this last night. Because originally, like, a few weeks ago, I told Kat... I'm a huge D. Wallace fan, but I wasn't a huge fan of her in Cujo. I really like her as the mom in E.T. Like, I love her in E.T. Right. Uh, she actually makes a special appearance in this really underrated horror movie called The House of the Devil, which I'm trying to get Kat to watch it for <laughs> Halloween. So I, uh, you know, I just, I think she's a great, great person. And part of this love comes from, I actually saw her speak at a horror movie convention. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just, I'm sorry, I do this every time I mention this convention. It was a horror convention, not a horror movie convention. <laughs> <laughs> so you had horror artwork, you had horror movies talked about, and also I'm sure horror books, but I wasn't into books back right. then. But anyway, I bought like two thousand dollars worth, of, Woo, like worth of girl, maybe a thousand. Treat yourself. Yeah, this is back in 2014, <laughs> so a long, long time ago. A lot of my stuff in my parents' house in my room over there, tons of stuff came from that convention. I bought so much merch, like horror movie merch. But Dee Wallace talked. So they had panels. So I also went to the Children of the Corn panel. They had a Nightmare Before Christmas oh, panel wow. with actors from the that. film uh, and also actors from Children of the Corn. And Dee Wallace was there and she talked about Cujo. She talked about E.T. She talked about the passing of her husband who stars in Cujo with her. And also The Howling. And also more. Yes. There's, uh, there's multiple movies mm -hmm. they've starred in together. So we will talk about all that. But my love for Dee Wallace comes from seeing her at this convention. And so it was weird, though, that Cujo is one of her biggest roles and it was never my favorite. However, after watching this documentary and reading the book, I I told Kat at first, you know, I'm not a big fan of Dee Wallace's casting. But then when I really think about it, her it's not her. She's perfect with the dog and the kid during the attack scenes. I can't imagine anyone else playing her, but like I just don't like her chemistry with the guy. And it's more about the husband, the actor who plays the right. husband. Right. I think not a lot of it has to, because I even I, I I asked Kelsey. I was like, you know, who would you pick to be? Because I like Dee Wallace as the mom. I think she did a fantastic job, and the chemistry with her son is wonderful. It's almost like they were really mom and son. Yes. Okay. Uh, in reality. Um, and so I, I even, I broached that subject with you. I was like, well, who else would you put in that role? And, and then, then when she, she like... asked me that, I was like, wait a second. I said, cause we also, I, I, I have this linked below. We watched the documentary, Kat and I, mm -hmm. it was about the making of Cujo, the movie. And I've linked below. So after yes, you're done with YouTube, us. it's on YouTube, so you can easily find it. And it's fabulous. Like I said, the link's right in our description yeah. right now. So, you know, pop it up in a separate tab 
pause it, keep it for later. But the documentary just talks about how close D. Wallace and the son were mm -hmm. and how D. Wallace was really bonded with the son's actual mom yes. and how they were all really, really close. But it also mentioned how the casting of the husband it was his first movie role he had done soaps and that really showed soaps and theater but once i, I saw the gonna... clips of her in the dog attack mm -hmm. scenes again and you had asked me that question as i'm watching these clips of her from the movie when she's with the son i said you're i can't imagine anyone else doing right. what d wallace no. did like she is perfect i was just thinking of her as the mom before all of that she had some stiff parts like she just came up as stiff but it was with the husband yes it's not really with the sun and with Cujo. Yes. So really I was kind of just, I don't know. I was jumping the gun by telling Kat, I didn't love D Wallace in Cujo. I do love her in Cujo, especially at the end. It's just that I don't like her with the guy and it's the guy's fault. Not oh, hers. Yeah, yeah, not her. No, no. Anyway, we will talk about the book and we'll talk more about the movie later, but keep an eye out on that documentary linked below because it was so good, but we will be talking about some tidbits we learned from it. Yes, we will. Yeah. So let's dig into the book. Like I said, one of my favorites, I cannot even believe I'm saying this five stars, five stars for me too. Yeah. It was five stars I was very me. surprised. Like some people might think it drags a little bit, but for me, just I liked a lot of the extra and I also listened to it on audio which was fantastic by the way and I liked the extra tidbits like finding out more about the husband's mm -hmm. advertising because in the movie I never paid attention to that well, there was so much backstory that just made like I'm I'm telling you when you see the movie it's a different experience if you haven't read the book it is once you read the book and then watch the movie you appreciate the movie a little bit because you've got more information and you feel I don't know. You have more of a connection with the characters. Yes. Even it's, Cujo, because yes, I, yes. my favorite thing about the book Cujo is that we get Cujo's point I of know. view. And I have discovered, especially in August, because I've read more than one book with a dog's point of view. The other book I read, Kelly is here right now. Kelly Hooked on Books. Check out her YouTube channel and her Instagram. Her book club read Thor by Wayne Smith. I told you you would like yes. it. It's told from a German Shepherd's point oh, of view, but I he's have... a good dog. But you would cry. Would you would legit one. cry. Because I have a German Shepherd. Dog. I know she has got like a German Shepherd puppy and she had German Shepherds in the past, right? You had yes, other ones. I had two. Yes. yes. So by the way, Thor told from the dog's point of view, incredible, but apparently I really like that in books because in Cujo, that is my favorite part of Cujo is that we get Cujo's thoughts. Yes. And that's amazing. Important. This is my cover for Cujo. I don't know if y'all can see that. Yeah. Sorry about my ring light reflecting, but look at that wonderful original. That's him coming color. out of the fog. That's what we, Wonderful. we don't know if you can and see And before we start not. going in our tidbits, I just want to check in with everybody real quick. Yes. The book cult is here. Hey, how hey. you doing? And yes, Kelly is admitting she's taking a break from King for now. Uh, That's fair. That's fair. Katrina just got home from Halloween hunting. Oh, I Ooh. hope you do a haul and I hope you check out our haul. I love watching other people's hauls. I do too. And I love filming hauls. So. I do too. And Katrina says the book is so sad. Also. It is. It is. DJ's here and says, hello, hello. Hello, hello. And Kelly says she's not sure if she'll read Cujo, but she's aware of the big difference, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about later. Halco is here. Hi. Hey. And guys, just a reminder, we will be talking spoilers. So Kelly mentioned a big difference. There is a huge difference between the endings of the book and movie. And I don't want to spoil it. So just a warning, anyone who has not read the book and wants to in the future and doesn't want it spoiled, we will be talking spoilers mm -hmm. eventually. All right. And did I miss anybody? Arlene says D. Wallace had a tiny role in the step wives yes she wow. did in 1975 oh. i looked at her um her wikipedia yesterday and her imdb by the way at the convention she talked about how she does like these self-help talks uh -huh. where she talks about the importance of self and like you know how to get over bad times because she had a really tough time after yes. her husband died because it was so unexpected he had a heart attack yes and um she told some really heartfelt stories about her husband and i loved her so much because she was cool she just seemed like a very cool soul mm -hmm. but also because i felt for her because she was talking about all these stories with her and her husband like on mm -hmm. film sets and i was like oh my god she makes me well, so it's sad. sad because they were married for 15 years and they, had a they have a daughter mm -hmm. and she's also an actress very beautiful girl and um you know like they were soulmates i mean she says they were soulmates and it was an unexpected he was only 55. i know very I young mean, to pass away young. from a heart attack and he was in shape yes i mean you see him in cujo yes, he plays the know. um i forgot his name but the man that uh d wallace's character has an affair with the town stud oh yeah yeah oh steve kemp yeah steve kemp so uh paul laughed because it's not in the uh, book but in there's a line in the film where yes. he's like uh the town stud 
uh, I can't believe I'm running around with the town stud. No offense. And Paul's like, who would be offended at being called a, a stud? <laughs> anyway, he was like, none taken. He's like, who would be offended by that? But I, I laughed at that. Oh my gosh, Juan is here from Plagued by Visions. Hi, Hello. Juan. Thanks for joining. And also, Katrina says that Dean Koontz does a uh, point of view. Uh, multiple books yeah. of dogs yes yeah. so watchers is one that dean Koontz does with a point of view of a dog which i really want to read really bad i own watchers i believe it's called watchers and not the watchers but i know he does it in multiple books katrina just read one with a point of view of a dog oh, and good. also um dark hollow doesn't that have the point of view of the dog and that's by brian keen but that one's more sad that's another one you would cry oh, yeah. yeah i don't know if i could handle it i do not know but Let's dig Let's into dig Cujo. In. Okay, Cujo was written in 1981. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I want to share before we get started um, two things: the inspiration behind Cujo, why Stephen King decided to write this sad story, and then something about the name. Mm -hmm. You know why he chose Cujo. So this fabulous book that Kelsey got for me. This, uh, this, this pays this, off. This, this, this thing book right off. here, I'm telling you, love it. It's the last copy at Barnes and Noble, by the way, love it. was at Barnes and Noble. Saw this book, I said, forget. Well, it's just wonderful. It's just a wonderful book because right here, I can answer three questions that about this situation, the inspiration, where the name came from and what was going on with Stephen King at this moment. Many of y'all know that Stephen King struggled for about a decade with drugs and alcoholism. Um, and it was at this point, really like a tipping point where his family did the inspir uh, the inspiration, the intervention. Mm -hmm. Okay, They were inspired to do an intervention. Thank God, because I just don't even know what would have happened to him. I cannot imagine a world without Stephen King. I know. But the thing about it is I just can't imagine <laughs> like if they would not have done an intervention, like where would he be today kind of thing. Yeah. But just oh, bear with me because there's a couple of passages I want to read because it just it knocks out all of that information. Uh, the first thing is um, in his book on writing, um, he talks about when he was writing Cujo and he said that it was at the, e the end of his adventures. He was drinking a case of 16 ounce tall boys a night. And wow. there's one novel Cujo that he barely remembers writing at all. And he does not say that with pride or shame only with a vague sense of sorrow and loss. Wow. Um, he likes that book and he wishes that he remembered enjoying the good parts as he put those on paper. And he also said if there was a book, I read this somewhere and I can't remember where it was um, in my research, but if there was a book he could go back and rewrite, Cujo would be one of them. You saw it on the documentary because the documentary was talking about how he would change the ending of Cujo. Well, that That's because he got a lot of regret. hate mail, but I mean, he's gotten hate mail all throughout his years. I love if, the ending of Cujo. I, I'm well, so glad does, he didn't change okay, it. Because it's more realistic. It's yes. not Hollywood. I can understand. People can't handle stuff visually i'm glad they and changed it for the why, movie right and yes and we'll he, talk about this yeah, we'll further about but that. but basically without telling you what it's discussing yet because we haven't gotten there yet but king wishes you could change the ending of cujo he expressed that at one point i don't know if he still feels this way but i'm glad the ending is the way well and everybody has to understand stephen king loves animals mm -hmm. okay and he loves kids i mean and he loves family so it's not like he's you know despises these things and that's why he drags them through these horrible things no i actually think he goes through great lengths <laughs> to paint cujo as good that's why we get the point of view of cujo right. and i think it's more apparent how good of a dog he is in the book than in the movie oh yeah in the movie you barely get any scenes of the dog and that's being why sweet. i think that's why i think it's important that you read the book first because right. when you're watching the movie you already have it's almost like you knew the family and everything that was going on. And this was like a snippet of their life that now you're seeing, like you've known them for years mm -hmm. and the movie is now like a day in their life. Right. That happened after you knew them for years. That's how, kind of how I. So you it. think the book gives a grander sense of knowing that, everything, yes. the family and yes. yes. And even the dog. I mean, yes. Yeah. Yes. So at one point in Cujo, Donna Trenton recalls that Cujo was the name of one of the members of the radical terrorist group, the Symbionese Liberation Army, the organization that kidnapped Patty Hearst. King has from time to time talked about a novel he began writing in 1974 called The House on Value Street, which was about the SLA's kidnapping of Patty Hearst. That novel metamorphosized into The Stand. Oh. Yes. Yeah, so that's where Cujo comes. And actually, I think there was also uh, the way it sounded. Um, 
and spelled was different, but it ended up being Cujo the way we see it on the cover. And then the last uh, part is that in 1982, um, he was interviewed with, uh, he did an interview with Douglas E. Winter in Stephen King, The Art of Darkness. And King talked about an incident that planted the seeds of Cujo. I took, he had a motorcycle. I took the bike out there and I just barely made it. And this huge St. Bernard came out of the barn growling. Then this guy came out and I mean, he was Joe Camber. He looked like one of those guys out of Deliverance. And if you've ever seen that movie, <laughs> yeah. terrible. I've seen it once and I'll never watch it again. That's how scarred for life I was from it. <laughs> uh, and I was retreating and wishing that I was not on my motorcycle when the guy said, don't worry, he don't bite. And so I reached out to pet him and the dog started to go for me. And the guy walked over and said, down Gonzo, or whatever the dog's name was, and gave him this huge whack on the rump. And the dog yelped and sat down. The guy said, Gonzo never done that before. I guess he don't like your face. <laughs> <laughs> guess he don't like your face. That's really mean. Did you did you like my I liked your accent? accent. Yes. I, I can't do a country accent like that. Because I already have an accent, apparently. So, so anyway, that kind of knocked out like what inspired, where'd the name come from, and what was going on with Stephen King like when he was writing this book. Yeah, he was freaking drunk i mean apparently. i i think this book is underrated i think it's I, heartbreaking but i think it's very well written i think it's super underrated like i cannot believe how not excited i was to read it and how i literally finished it in two days well i also listened to it on audio which i yeah, feel like it doesn't know but that doesn't make a difference it does because you could listen to it on higher speeds but at the same time like i never felt like oh i've been listening for three hours i better take a break it just felt like really like well, i want to think about it going. audio can be work if you're in a book that's a slog it can and be. you're listening to it i mean you could your right. mind could be wandering you're or right. whatever so the fact that you blew through it is good yeah and i i really was surprised by it and there is connections to the dead zone which we mm -hmm. will be reading now that we had some people say before we started reading Cujo that we should swap the places of Dead Zone and Cujo because Dead Zone we're not reading until November. Right. And Cujo was always planned for August. We had our year schedule planned out for the mm -hmm. Year of King Reading Project. And some people were like, well, it's spoilers. It, it's a big deal. It's really not. It's a reference, it but it doesn't reference. necessarily spoil big, big things for the Dead Zone. I'm still excited about the Dead Zone. I still mm -hmm. have not watched the movie, so I feel like it'll still be fresh. Even after be. seeing the references in Cujo, I'm not worried. Um, and no, so you'll be fine because I've read the Dead Zone. It's been years, but I've read the Dead Zone. And I, I think, if anything, it's making us be more excited of, about finding out more about this. Because, yeah, we know about the bad guy. It references killer. essentially the bad guy mm -hmm. and the killer in the Dead and Zone. And we've already had references to him. We had references in It to him. Yeah. So in the movie, they don't really obviously reference him at all. Well, no, because... They, they didn't want it to... Feel the like director, a supernatural. Well, the director took that out. He didn't want that element. He wanted to concentrate more on the family dynamics um, than on that supernatural. Because exactly. it, it was like another subplot. It was all these different subplots. Well, that's why it was exciting to read the book because I had no idea after seeing the movie that all this extra stuff would be in here. So to me, the little mm -hmm. supernatural element that almost like part of that bad guy spirit kind of helped Cujo be almost like superhuman like he was going to be mean no matter what because he got rabies right with or without the influence of this bad guy from the dead zone but because he had this i'm guessing the spirit was kind of a part of cujo i think it made him a little bit more i guess more than just so a dog. you think he was possessed because there's theories he was but it's not conclude like stephen king's never said that do you think? I think when the dad goes into the closet, when he's wondering where they are and he sees the red eyes and it looks like the dog, I think it he is. I think the spirits possessed Cujo okay. of the dead zone. That's, guy. Interesting. That's what I think. But what do you guys think? Do you have any <laughs> theories about the dead zone connection? Um, one says, oh, while writing Cujo, Stephen King was more than drunk. Oh, yes, yes, well, yes, yes, but yes. drunk at the least. Yes. And Katrina says she got the question at Trivia Night right when they asked what book doesn't Stephen King remember writing <laughs> good job yeah I don't know if I would have gotten that right because I didn't really know that um until we watched that documentary yeah so basically this is what I think it's basically the story is two women from different worlds economically in troubled marriages and they make choices that yield consequences that drastically change their lives 
That's kind of how I, my take on it. While the dog Cujo suffers and causes the deaths of four people, secrets kept by the two women indirectly are responsible for the outcome. Cujo is pretty much a metaphor. Donna fears, fears getting older and loses herself, you know, and losing herself, meaning that she has this affair. Mm -hmm. And then Charity fears for her son that he's following in Joe's footsteps. And what I think is interesting is um, Donna has the means. So it's almost like it's a, a whim, a frivolous thing that she can do because she has the means to be able to go out and play. Mm -hmm. You know, when the cat's away, the mice will play. She's mm -hmm. the mice or the mouse. And poor Charity is stuck. Stuck because they are not, they're not wealthy. They're poor. And but money helps her money have this momentary right. this momentary but, escape. But Cujo actually saves both of these women, even though that there are tragic circumstances with that. Both of them are saved in a sense. That's true. That's how I feel. Okay. But I mean, some other people might not think that. I love that analysis. Of the loss, but I kind of feel like they both are saved and the fears that they had in their lives were not truly fears. Like when the fears that Donna has to face at that moment. I feel like Cujo makes them look at their fears in a different way. Yes. I feel like Cujo makes them reframe their fears and gives them a basis to re, uh, like reanalyze everything they thought. Well, it before. gives them also the strength to overcome the fears that they've been having all of this time. And, and know that they're stronger than they ever believed. Mm -hmm. I, I do think, I love your analysis. I mean, <laughs> I do think it's really at the heart of it about two women and it's really about a families. Yes. Family, well, two big family relationships, stories. Yes. But the two families are on the opposite ends. Yes. You know, it's not like two couples that live in the same neighborhood. Right. They're on the total opposite ends of the spectrum. And you even see that moment because they really don't even talk about the Camber family in depth like they do. The story, the film, in my opinion, is about the Trenton family. Yes. And focuses on that. But there is a moment in the film where Donna looks at Charity and what Charity is doing. She's plucking a chicken. Mm -hmm. Like she's, she's, Donna goes to the store and buys her chicken already mm -hmm. ready to go. Right. Charity's got to get her chicken, kill it, and then pluck the There's like a moment where they like so realize. She, she, they both of them know. And you can just imagine what they're thinking in their minds. You know, Charity might be feeling a moment of embarrassment. Donna may be feeling a moment of embarrassment because it's almost like, okay, I was so dissatisfied with my life. But look at what I have right. compared to these people. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I just think that that's kind of an interesting take on it. So that's why I say it's more about like relationships and these two women, they're like at the the center of this. It's so much struggle. more than a story about a, a rabid, rabid dog. dog. Yeah, exactly. 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 Mr. Morningstar is here and he says, Kujo hey. was such a good boy. I know. Cat was very oh, sad. Look, I don't Kat. know, guys. I don't know if I'm going to make it without crying in, in this in this <laughs> chat. Literally, I I, there's parts. I in love here. dogs, but I could read it. I don't. I don't know why I can like disassociate with books, but not so much with movies. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's because we got Luna after losing my dog Sophie, my German Shepherd Sophie, in January, and we got Luna on Valentine's Day, and I'm in so in love with my dog. <laughs> That's the weirdest thing, but um, I don't know. When I look at her beautiful little face, I'm just like, if this would happen to my, my yeah. Luna, I would be like devastated. Like the fact that Cujo thinks and has a point of view, I'm, I look at her sometimes and even my other little dog, I look at them when they look at me with their beautiful little faces. I'm like, what are they thinking? Are they like thinking I'm being a good girl or I'm being a good boy? I mean, I'm just, I don't know. Like it makes me want to tear up right now, but. I just, you know, we're talking about rabies. I did a little deep dive on that. I oh, don't know if you know much about I it. I don't. I did a little bit. I didn't because there's so much information on it. But um, is it okay if I share? Yes, please. Okay. Well, I got this information off the CDC website. So if you're interested and want to dive even deeper, I would suggest checking it out. Um, rabies is a fatal but preventable viral disease. 
And that's the one thing is that Cujo did not have a vex. He was not vaccinated. He didn't have any shots. No, which is crazy to me when you think about. It. I guess in some ways I can see it. In well, because some they're ways such I a can't. rural family, I they think didn't they were have a rural, lot of but money. you would almost think that they would almost they would have gotten it because they were in the rural situation. Because the I like, odds. I like how King goes into depth explaining how they didn't know about this hole on the property. They didn't well, that's know true. about yeah, that. That is true. That type that is of, true. And there were bats around. You, know, I did like he went through crazy lengths to explain that he didn't have any shots in the movie i didn't know he didn't have shots i mean but you assume well, he right didn't, you but... didn't yeah you assume that because if he got infected right but but it even says i think i read somewhere that you can still get infected even if you have a shot but it's not as bad it's not fatal or something right well, you probably have a better chance of surviving. It. Yes, exactly. So basically what rabies does is it infects the central nervous system. It is spread to people and pets if bitten or scratched by a rabid animal. In the U.S., it is mostly found in wild animals like bats, raccoons, skunks, and foxes. All cute animals, in my opinion. Yes. Uh, in many other countries, dogs still carry rabies. Most rabies deaths around the world are caused by dog bites. Oh, wow. Believe it or not. Um, it's a terrible death if left untreated. Um, a rabies vaccine is important for cats, dogs, and ferrets can also get uh, vaccinated. I used to have ferrets and we would have them vaccinated as well. So you need to protect your pets, you, your family by getting them vaccinated. Um, and also one of this leave wildlife alone. Don't fool with wildlife mm -hmm. uh, because it's a lead. One of the leading causes of rabies deaths in people in the U.S. is infected bats, believe it or not. Really? International is rabid dogs. And believe it or not, we had a bat come into our house. We didn't oh. know. I had gone to a scrapbook con convention uh, where you scrapbook all weekend. And I had brought my little case in with some of my stuff. Well, I went to go get money out of it. And when I moved it, there was a little baby bat underneath my case. I have no idea where it came from. Oh, my God. OK, so, of course, I'm freaked out because the first thing I'm thinking is rabies. <laughs> yes. How long has it been in there? You know, kind of thing. So the first thing you think is rabies. Yeah, that's the first yes. thing I thought about. So I immediately looked up um, to see if there was a wildlife rehabilitator in our area. And I live in a rural area. So there was one probably about 30 minutes away away from where, you know, I live. So I called her up and she said, yes, I could bring it. Um, so I went ahead and I put gloves on really thick gloves. We had like this little container that had, you know, airflow and, um, we can, a top that had airflow. Yeah. Like the holes. Or yes. Whatever. Yes. Like it's like a critter carrier. Oh, okay. So anyway, I scooped it up. It did not really move. So I was like, maybe it's sick. And of course, rabies. <laughs> rabies. So I put it in there and my youngest son, Andrew and I took it. And when we got it there, uh, the woman looked at it and she said it was a baby and that it was severely dehydrated. Well, oh. cause who knows how long it was and in that's there. Why it, wasn't it was moving. there a couple of days. That's right. why it wasn't moving. So anyway, she took it. I made a little donation to her because rehabilitators don't get paid from the state. You that know, they nice do of all you. of that yeah. on your own time or whatever. But if you want more information about rabies, you know, check it out on the CDC, but it is very important that you get your animals we would vaccinated. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the office for a second. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That scene. If you guys like the office. Yes. Poor Meredith. <laughs> Dwight traps oh. her head in a trash bag oh, with a with bat, bat. <laughs> and she does get rabies, doesn't she? And then Just they create that ridiculous. Yes. And they create that ridiculous fund about rabies. And anyway, it's got a crazy name. With a big check. Yes. So there's a whole big storyline on the office about rabies yes. and bats. So there you go. More info. Yes, more info. <laughs> Fictional <laughs> info. But yes, there you go. Yeah. So it is scary. Like to me, rabies is scary. And um It is. You yeah. know, it's just a shame because he was such a sweet and he was a good boy. Especially in the book. I mean, yeah. you, I, I love my one of my my favorite parts of the book is the fog scene. You do get mm -hmm. a, a kind of a sense, but honestly, I, I mark I, that in my book. I, I did I, mark that. I didn't a hundred percent get that scene until I read the book. Like I didn't get that he still was aware of himself and who he was still at that point, Cujo. Mm -hmm. But in the book, it drives it home when you watch the movie after reading the book and you remember that scene. Basically, when Cujo sees the little boy in the fog. And he almost wants to bite him, but he thinks, no, 
He's my he, boy. He's it's, my it's boy. He's never done anything bad I think bad it's basically his last time that he's recognizing his family and his boy. It's the last you know, time before the rabies completely takes, takes over. over. Or the guy from the dead zone, however you want to think of it. <laughs> both. <laughs> um, I I just love that scene. I do too. Yeah. It, I mean, it's Powerful. heartbreaking. And it's dramatic irony for you as the reader. Because you know what's going on. You have all this information, but the family doesn't. Well, There's some idea. I mean, Brett, the kid he Brett suspects. thinks he might have gotten into poison bait because he even says if it would have happened to a wild animal, he would have recognized it more. But would he, you know, would that have affected him? I don't and, know. I don't know. But he he's just, I think part of that is denial, you know, and he also makes the choice. They make the choice, which was really telling to me when he goes to his mother and they're about to go on their trip and he's like, I think we need to tell dad. And the mom is like, no, because we she won't knows be able to go. we won't be able to go. He'll and use she it is so desperate to get out of that house and get to her sisters and get Brett, you know, into a different situation because she's fearing for him turning into Joe. And, you know, he's at a place where he seems more loyal to his mom or else he wouldn't have checked with his mom first. Right, yeah. right. But he then knew he that goes along with it because he thinks he's going to be able to get back in there. But it was just so heartbreaking to me to think that is the last time he sees his dog. Yeah. You know? But it's also heartwarming because like Cujo resisted so much. He did not want to hurt the boy. So it's like it's better that he saw him for the last time and. Kuja walked away. Well, and also him too, well, I was going to say, it's also would have been terrible for him to see his beloved dog turn into, you know, this monstrous. Exactly. You know, so I uh, think that was creature. a better way to see him as the, for the last time versus seeing him get worse and worse. But God, yeah, lots of layers in the book. I honestly, it was so surprised by the book and taken aback by how much I loved it. It's the details that really added in so much. Who knew a dog? I mean, a book about a dog, a dog about a dog, a book about a dog could be about so much more, really. And it's really not just about a dog, as we said. And right. let's let, let's read some comments here. One agrees with us. Again, check out one's YouTube channel. We've got a couple of people with some wonderful YouTube channels in the chat right now, by the way. Katrina Brown, check out hers. Kelly Hooked on Books, check out hers. Mr. Morningstar, check out his. And one, check out his. I definitely agree. Cujo is also kind of a, an escape from the complicated tangle of their lives. Marriage tensions are difficult and emotionally complex. A Rabbit St. Bernard is an easier monster to face. Great. I love that. Yes. I love that because it's true. It's like, you know, these two women have to deal with their human monsters. Okay. If you yes. think about it, because Vic Trenton to me was a sweet guy. Uh, and even though they, you know, had their issues and Donna was feeling lonely, you know, because he's working a lot. But she recognized he was a great guy. The thing about it is she chose such a horrible person. And in the book, he's worse. Oh, he's, he's way, way worse, worse than in the movie. Like, I, I could not stand him. I almost wish that Cujo would have killed him. I know. I hated, I, I hated him to too. say that, but... I cannot believe... Like, oh my God, they they made it so light in the movie. What he writes on the board, I got so... I left some upstairs for I your know, baby. What just, he does in her oh, and he was just so vulgar and I know. terrible. And, I couldn't believe she chose oh, him. Well, but I think it was because it was... It was a mask over his monster. He was like a, a, what is that, a petulant child or whatever, where, you know, I don't get my way. So now you're going to see the true me. Like, yeah. I think he, you I know, think she was knew he one was dangerous, way. but she was attracted to the danger. And she never thought maybe that he was that dangerous. Right. Like, he was psycho. Like, I almost yeah. wonder, like, what would have happened if she would have been there? Wait, now, in the movie, he seems like mostly a nice guy until she breaks up with him. And then he, like, he damages some pillows. I mean, big deal. It's, right. it's definitely downgraded from the book. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the movie to me is PG. Is definitely um, very vanilla. And, and <laughs> I don't like how we don't even get the story behind her affair. You're like kind of confused. Like why? Mm -hmm. But I mean, in the movie, I guess you're just thinking that he's handsome, that he makes her feel good. You assume all this, but there's just so much more depth well, to I it. Well, I think the reason why, and that's, that's why I said what I said earlier, is... It's almost like the focus was more on the moment that they're at the Camber 
home and they're fighting Cujo and all that kind of stuff. It's almost like the book was what was happening before that day, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing leading up to, because everything was so fast, you know, to get to that moment. Yeah. But in the movie, it was. Yes. Fast. That's yeah. what I think. Uh, now, Plague by Vision says it reminds me of the use of giant uh, mutant, mutant creatures. creatures in the 50s. Nuclear war and political tensions were too complex, but using giant monsters as symbols simplified this fear for audiences. That's that's awesome. Yeah, that's a great comparison. Mm -hmm. Like Godzilla after Hiroshima. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Perfect. yeah. And let's look about the UK Ar and rabies yes. here. Arlene says they had public information adverts on rabies in the UK in the 70s. Ap absolutely petrifying yeah. daniel's here hi daniel hey, how you daniel. doing oh damn you bots are here get out of here bots <laughs> bot bot bitches anyway sorry <laughs> <laughs> sorry i blocked him all right daniel says one of my earliest memories is of my grandmother's dog going rabbit oh no oh, i'm so sorry and terrible. what the dog catcher did to subdue then kill him still have nightmares oh, i am so sorry that is, oh, that is a nightmare like a true life yes. nightmare oh my god i wouldn't oh, wish that on anybody because no, no. as you know in like the they have to chop off their heads to test I if they know. really were rabid after they kill them. And it's, I love another thing in the book that I love, by the way, is that we get the aftermath afterwards. Mm -hmm. And it's because the ending is different in the book than the movie. Well, the you movie's find about out what happens to her, back together. you know, because clearly she ha had to have been exposed even in the movie. I know this sounds crazy, but when I watched the movie, I didn't even think about her having rabies, even though she was cut by him. But in the book, right away, she says, oh, I've got rabies. Right. Like, what the hell? I've got rabies. Mm -hmm. So that was a whole other scary element to me. Yes. I don't. I know it's dumb of me not mm -hmm. to have thought. Obviously, she was exposed because to I rabies. was thinking about Vic. I'm thinking not only is he losing his son, but it's possibility he's going to lose his wife. Yeah, and see, and even... in the movie, I didn't even connect that. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it's just it's it's just the way everything played out. It played out on Vic's insecurities and his loss and his fear of loss, because now not only was he worried about losing his business, he was worried about losing his wife, losing his child, you know, if they would end up getting a divorce. And now he's in this position where he's lost his son, but he's possibly could lose his wife, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing. And I, I just I know we're kind of a little jumping to the wards, the ending, but I kind of in my mind think it brings them closer. It saves their marriage. And even though they are sad about losing Ted, and it's going to be something that weighs on them for quite a while, if not their whole entire life, I think in my heart, they're going to try again. They're going to have another day. I, I think their because, relationship is stronger. Yes. And honestly, like, bear with me, guys. I, I do want to say that, like, I love the ending of Cujo the book. I know it's sad that... It is very sad. It's sad that the little boy but dies. it's realistic to me. It's realistic to me, too, after being in that car for so long. But I love how Donna reacts about trying to save him. It's so powerful. It's just powerful. It's mm -hmm. some powerful passages. It's a powerful ending. And I know... At one point, not sure if he still feels this way. I know he regrets the ending. He wanted it to be a happier ending. I love that it's bleak in a way, but it's actually happy because in a way too. So it's bleak and happy at the same time if, if that even is possible, but I think it is. So you've got the realistic bleak part about the sun dying. It's sad, it sucks, but it's also realistic. Then you've got the happiness, like you said, their marriage is saved. They're closer together. And I do think you get a sense that they're going to try again mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that there is some hope for the future. Not that that takes away anything from their loss. It doesn't mean it erases the loss. And both families had a loss because, you know, the Trentons lose Tad, the Cambers lose Cujo. Cujo and but it frees both of them from the fears that they had exactly. so that they can move on exactly. and live the lives that they want to live. I mean, Charity realizes that even though her sister is in a much better place and escaped a lot of what she's living, if her sister would have stayed, she would have been in the same boat that Charity was in. She sees all these things and she sees how it is. And it's not so much that I think she longs for what her sister has in the things. She longs for the freedom. She longs for being able to make decisions on her own. I don't think she dislikes where she lives so much as who she lives with. I think I think you see that coming into her mind when she's with her sister. Mm -hmm. She doesn't necessarily love the way her sister's living, you know, all about money. She likes her lifestyle and being independent and not like... Mm -hmm. 
being all about money, but like you said, she doesn't like who she's with and the right. fear. Oh yeah, that her, he's scary. He is horrible. He really her. is horrible. horrible. I mean, he bargained with her for more after she was going to give him all of her money that right. she won. Right. Anyway, that's besides the point. But I also love the ending in terms of examining how they move on after Cujo mm -hmm. and how the scene just about him getting gifted a new puppy and his first question is. Does he have his shots? That's very powerful, but it's also powerful that it shows that he's crying. Yes. So to me, it's yes. like it's it's a new beginning, well, but it's, it's also, also a too sadness that she was able to save him, save him from becoming his father. Yeah, that he's showing emotion. You know? that like he's it was not so close because she was seeing inklings of it when she was, you know, when they were at the house at the sister's house, and that she didn't like that part of him. And so I just think it's like. It, had they stayed, if things would not have worked out, if she would not have won that lottery money and couldn't have gotten there, you know, what would he turn out to be, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing. Um, I just think it, everything about the end was powerful. And I hate to say that I'm glad that the, this is spoilers again. I, I, I'm, I, I'm not saying I'm glad the kid died, but it surprised me. It was one of the few Stephen King reads we had this year that totally threw me for a loop because I was like, the kid lives. And I thought it was like the book well, ended that way. Well, but think about it. Look at how how grim um, Pet Cemetery was. No, I know, but I just assumed that the movie and the book had the same ending. I don't know why uh, I assumed well, that. Well, or look at The Mist. Well, that's true. You know, what I'm, I'm not saying? saying that Stephen King doesn't do bleak endings. I just didn't think that well, it was going to be a different ending. The mist was flip flopped. Yeah. I mean, there was hope in the mist, but there was uh, no was hope a, in the movie. Oh my gosh, yeah, that such was, a bleak ending. That was super bleak. Um, yes. But we have a whole chat about yes, the mist. Yes, we by do. The way. So uh, I mean, I'm saying something for people that might not, but we do have a whole video. We with do spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't give away anything specific for that, but Katrina says Michael McDowell, who I love, and I'm reading his book for my book club in September, guys, if you guys want to join in, we're reading The Amulet. Katrina says Michael McDowell has an awesome rabies kill scene, not with a dog, oh, in one of his books. It was disturbing. Ooh. I can't wait to get there because I do plan on reading all of his books, including his like non-horror stuff, which is more like Blackwater. It's a saga, which I'm really, I, I own the saga like a collection of it so i'm excited to try to read more by him in september with the amulet in the next year you should read you'd like him oh, he's yeah. from the south and he's really like really really awesome in terms of the way he writes it's so eloquent and just really just awesome and subtle but also really horrific writing at the same time he does slow horror well but he does like visual horror really oh, well good, like good. it's in your face at the same time i'll add them to my extensive tbr yes so it's an, it's ever it's growing. so it's so long it's yes. like a scroll like when i all right so guys i do want to say what did you guys think about the book what did you rate the book i want to find out what you thought it's not all about us and what we think we want to know what you guys think Okay, I only have a couple of other little things to say about the book. Oh, Rainbow um, Fright is here. Hey, Rainbow hey. Fright. She also has a YouTube channel, by the way. She says, hey, everyone, Cujo is one of my favorites. I bet the book is way more suspenseful. Yes, uh, the book is different, a lot different. And there's more backstory about everything. Yeah, I think you'll appreciate the film more. If you, you read, read the, the book. book. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And we're going to um, talk about the film a little bit. Or do you still want to talk I, about I mean, it? I just have a couple of little tidbits, if Go you ahead. don't mind. Go ahead with the tidbits. Um, other mentions of Cujo, just to let you know, I like when the universe kind of collides yeah with you know? Stephen King's other books um he appears in a short story which is out of skeleton crew called Mrs. Todd shortcut there's a mention of Joe Camber getting killed by his own dog that's mentioned in that short story also there's another short story called grandma uh also in skeleton crew Joe Camber's hill is mentioned so where they live oh um he makes appearances in pet cemetery which, which we, we read yeah we saw that reference and we were like yeah we're gonna reference. see it again in needful things awesome um the body which is uh stand by me is the movie that mm -hmm. from the body the dark half which we did read and because I of noticed Castle Rock. That. Yep. okay uh in films it's cat's eye uh which is all, was directed by the same director as Cujo. I actually, I liked Cats. I, I've seen that one. And then Gerald's Game. Um, yes. In the movie. Yes. In I remember that reference in the movie Gerald's Game. Now, Frank Dodd from The Dead Zone is mentioned. Uh, and like we talked about, there were thoughts that there was a supernatural element. element. Kelsey really is leaning towards that I, she believes that. I'm kind of like I not do. too sure about that myself. Um, well, how do you explain the closet? I don't know. I think, you know, it's a little kid with the closet. Maybe the, like, 
the power suggestion with the dad. No, you know, like sometimes I think when somebody tells well, the you the dad was the dad was legit it. seeing it. Like they were seeing, <laughs> they were smelling stuff in there. In the I closet. kept thinking at first that maybe Frank Dodd somehow lived in that house, or he killed somebody in the house, and they were like stuck in the closet, and they failed to tell these people this. But like you know how we were saying, <laughs> by the way, just a sidebar. I'm like, I keep going back to this, but Katrina said she read it a Cujo a while ago. She thinks she gave it four stars. I just cannot still believe I'm giving it five stars. And just to, I don't think you guys understand how much I liked it. I'm saying it's like in my top five or 10 right now. Like I really liked it. I liked it better than the dark half with people people think that one's underrated. I think Cujo is more underrated than the dark half because I feel like people like, you're just like, eh, whatever the end, it's like, whatever. I feel like they don't read it maybe because they think it's too much like the movie, like we thought. Yes, so yeah. I, I honestly think it's one of the most underrated King books. I never hear anyone talking about it. I maybe know. that's another reason I didn't, I didn't want to read it. I don't know. Anyway, it's like in my top 10 or five. I haven't really ranked things yet, but it's it's somewhere. It's up there. <laughs> it, it's freaking up there and I cannot even believe it. And Daniel Sweet says, I liked the books ending more, just made more sense. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, I, I just personally. think it's a little, uh, it's more of a realistic but, ending. But another sidebar, I do think the movie you can't really have it end the way the book well, did for Hollywood. Yeah, it wouldn't work. People would that. be pissed. Yeah, and you're also in the 80s, so. Yeah, well, go ahead with your more fun facts about the book. Okay, fun facts. We already talked about Stephen King barely remembering it. Uh, he got a lot of hate mail for killing off Ted Trenton, but that's mm -hmm. nothing new for him. He gets hate mail all the time because he kills somebody at some point. He gets hate like, mail for writing Cycle of the Werewolf and having too many full right, moons right, in a that year. Was hilarious. Science people are like, that it's not real. Hilarious. There's less full moons. Also, Cujo is on the banned book list. Really? Parents just don't like Stephen King. That was the quote. Uh, for a rough language, explicit sex scenes, profanity, violence, among other reasons. And in my handy dandy book here that I have. Um, but for I'm, like high schools? Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I understand not wanting like little kids to read sex scenes, but high school. to me the books that are in banned books. I don't agree with it. I don't agree with banned I, books I, at all. How do you guys feel? I think I, it's atrocious to ban books. I, I think don't. it's ridiculous. I think people who ban books don't understand what the books are about. I because mean, if you read don't Kujo, insult my intelligence to tell me what I can and cannot read or dictate what I think my kids can read. I think it's ridiculous. There's a whole story about this with Boy's Life, which... Robert they, McCammon flew to defend his book from a committee who were trying to, they were, they were reviewing books that were on the list and which books would really be banned. He flew to Florida to defend his book. And again, I'm talking about Robert McCammon. <coughs> I'm getting impassioned. I'm sorry. It's making me <laughs> cough. <coughs> but he went there. He successfully defended it. But if anyone who read Boy's Life would know, it's ridiculous to put it because there was a few curse words in it. That's why it was on the banned Ooh. book list. It's ridiculous because it's such about good versus evil and good triumphs. So it's ridiculous. Well, it's hypocritical, too. A lot of these parents <coughs> or people out there who uh, want to ban the books and they talk about <sighs> language use that language. It's just absurd. You know? It's so absurd it's, in every way when half of these books on this list have good messages overall. Well, it is. it's on the banned book list i haven't checked recently in 2022 but i know that there was periods of time where it has been this was a talk that he gave um, at a virginia beach lecture the talk took place um, at a virginia beach public library on september 22nd 1986 the day after stephen king's 39th birthday the lecture was recorded and transcribed by george beam author of the stephen king companion and King again revisited his truth inside the lie theme. Um, he says, I think that the real truth of fiction is that fiction is the truth. Moral fiction is the truth inside the lie. And if you lie in your fiction, you are immoral and have no business writing at all. Um, and then it says in this talk, King addresses the fact that some of his books have been banned in school, specifically mentioning Cujo, Salem's Lot, which is my favorite, and The Shining. This was when he gave some of his most well-known and repeated advice to students. And I love this. I, it gives me goosebumps. See my goosebumps? I do. She actually I would them. just say to you as students who are supposed to be learning that as soon as the book is gone from the library, do not walk run to your nearest public library or bookseller and find out what your elders don't want you to know because that's what you need to know. Don't let them bullshit you and don't let them guide your mind because once it starts, it never stops. Some of our most famous leaders have been book banners like Hitler, Stalin, and Idi Amin. Okay, so I'm passionate this. about this too because I'm sorry. I am passionate I, about it too. It's ridiculous. I could not, uh, like, you know, if you've ever read The Book Thief, 
or watch that movie. That's all about that. When the the um, Germans and Hitler made people throw their books Isn't that in a theme piles in Fahrenheit and, 451 as well? I can't remember. Books. I think that's a theme. Yes. I, I, it's been a long time since I read I mean, that book, I but. would be devastated. This if, is perfect. Daniel Sweet says banned and, and Rainbow Freight agrees with Daniel. Banned books give me Nazi book burning creeps. It's ridiculous. It's like, why do we live in a society? There's still. But they attack that books. Ban it. I mean, Stan Lee had to go before a committee in, in Washington to defend comic books. Really? Yes. Because there was so much how parents were so afraid. I think he and Jack Kirby both went together to do that. When I saw Robert McCammon to go me. to that committee meeting to defend Boy's Life, which is the most absurd book to try to ban because it's so beautiful and it has like nothing that's really like it doesn't condone badness at all. There's no yeah. sex. There's no there's a couple of curse words. So what? Uh, it's it's just so pure. I can't even believe people were the per, the woman who wanted to ban it took some lines out of context. She saw that it was on other banned books lists and uh, she didn't read the actual book. So mm -hmm. half of these people aren't even reading the books. They yeah, don't but, even understand the messages. But I, it's, it, it, it's outrageous. It's maddening. It's, I can't even understand it. I mean, I could go on and on about it because I taught for many years and the parents that come up with reasons that children shouldn't read books it, it's so hypocritical of the things that they do let them. I know people that don't want their kids to read Harry Potter because it's got witchcraft and oh, they don't want their kids to be studying witchcraft, but yet they'll let, they'll let their young children, you know, watch Snow White, which is Disney. There's a witch in there. She's doing witchcraft. How do you think uh, Snow White falls asleep? She eats a poison apple that was had a spell put She's on it. She's literally okay? mixing stuff in a cauldron. Line the Witch in the Wardrobe, written by a Christian author. Okay, about I had a witch in there who's the evil witch. I mean, I, I just don't understand why you're okay with that. But every Lord of the Rings has wizards, but it's uh, largely about good versus evil, and the good triumphs. The, the That's what I don't understand. Over the, parents. the years that have like you know criticized it, or I can't believe uh, for four years I worked in the library, and some of them, you know, not a lot of them, but you'd have one. Oh, I don't want my kid uh, reading Captain Underpants. That's that's ridiculous. Uh, it's inappropriate or whatever. Well, then your kid doesn't read it. But I'm not going to take it off the shelf because there is merit in it. If you don't want to see a flying turd in a comic book format, <laughs> don't read it. Yeah. Okay. But I think it's hilarious, actually. I mean, Dave Pilkey to me is hilarious. And it makes kids want to read. You have a lot of reluctant readers out the there, you know. And I mean, the list can go on and on and on. I mean, Witch of Blackbird Pond is a classic. And there was a parent that didn't want her child to read it because it was about witchcraft. No, it's not. It's about so much more. There's it's someone who's supposedly thought of as a witch. The main character is accused of witchcraft because she can swim. Do, it's historical fiction. Yeah. Do your research before you start saying kids can't, you know, read or whatever. I, I don't know. It, it they, they don't strikes even a understand. nerve with me. It strikes a <laughs> Arlene says, and this is funny, was not expecting this sudden diversion into a defense of freedom to read, but utterly agree. Well said. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, we both got impassioned there, but especially you, but you had some great points too. Uh, Rainbow Fright says it's a reason she's glad to have left Texas. I'm sure they banned books oh, yeah. really heavily there. Mm -hmm. Mr. Morningstar in Michigan, Nora Roberts just gave $50,000 to a local library because some fuddy-duddies were afraid of LGBTQ oh, awesome. books and killed the library millage. Go, Nora Roberts. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Because it's just a shame. I can't even believe this still exists in this day and age. I, I, but I mean, should I be surprised with everything so like controversial and like scary and crazy? But anyway... What's well, fear? It's fear. A lot of it's fear. You know, yeah. uh, fear and Cujo fear. Well, it's the fear. Books, yes. I think people don't want you to. They want you to be ignorant about stuff. I guess they must. You know, I just or I they're just know. so or they're ignorant afraid, themselves. Or they're afraid of what. You know, like someone will be exposed to something or enlightened about something. They're so ignorant themselves that they're afraid that, you know, they're going to be left behind as well. Maybe subconsciously it's part of it as well. well and you as a parent have to make good choices for your children. If your children are immature and you don't think they can handle the content, well, don't let them read it. Yeah. But if you've got mature enough kids that can handle certain content, I mean, they're going to find it anyway. And the minute you say that a child can't watch 
a scary movie or an inappropriate movie or you make a big deal about music lyrics or you make a big deal about yeah, a book I don't or whatever, any of that guess either. what that kid's going to do? The next time they spend the night at their friend's house or they get that's out the somewhere, first thing be doing. that's the first thing they're going to do because they're going to want to know what is in it. That's so terrible. Yeah. I'm not saying kids I'm should not, have no limits. No, that, but, I know, I'm not saying that but either. But it's like, you know, my parents let me watch Watership Down, which is not even a kid's movie. But People that, mislabeled it as a kid's movie. Said. But like it helped know create me who I was. And the message of Watership Down, even though there's blood and there's killing in the animated movie, and I watched it super young, there's like a better message to it. And like, you know... I'm sure my dad wasn't aware of the It was a deeper meaning. It was a deeper meaning. And I'm so glad I watched it. But Paul was like, your parents let you watch it? I'm like, hell yeah, I watched anything. My house was the house that, that kids could come to and watch PG-13 movies. Oh, yeah. And we were like eight. Oh. I watched The Fifth Element at like eight. Anyway, we also had a bar where we pretended to play bar. This is not a very good thing. But we like pour Sprite and pretend to get cry. <laughs> we were like, oh, it's a New Orleans thing, hilarious. I guess. But like, we were pretending, like, we also played kitchen, but mm -hmm. like, we did play in the bar. But we didn't drink alcohol, we drank Sprite. Also, I don't know if you know this before we go on to the movie. Go ahead. Uh, Baton Rouge is mentioned in the book. Did you catch yes, that? Yes, I did catch that. I was like, that's pretty funny. I live about 30 minutes away from Baton Rouge. So yeah. That's why I think that's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. I go to Baton Rouge <laughs> often. It's a state capital. It is. <laughs> okay, a lot movie of people, time. People think it's New Orleans, by the way. A lot of people. At one time it was. I know, but. Not anymore. Not anymore. Baton Rouge. Yes. The Red Stick. I wouldn't necessarily visit there. <laughs> if you're going to just visit Louisiana, go to New Orleans. No, don't go to Baton Rouge. <laughs> no it's boring. <laughs> no offense, Baton Rouge. Go ahead. <laughs> Let's talk about the movie 1983. What did you give it? It's hard. I flip flop because at first I didn't really like it that much, but like D. Wallace's scenes, four stars. Four stars for me, too. Yeah. D. Wallace carries. The, and the kid mm -hmm. and she talks about this so guys again um we have this documentary which is available on youtube i have the youtube video and it's three parts but the youtube the person who uploaded it to youtube mashed it together mm -hmm. this is an amazing it was it's called dog days or yeah i have it written down and uh it's basically the behind the scenes makings of cujo and they talk about how the little boy could turn it on and you could see this is like a six-year-old kid in real life and right. he's producing the fireworks and d wallace is complimenting him being like i couldn't believe yeah it's called dog days the making of cujo but again it's linked below if you guys are curious mm -hmm. and d wallace is complimenting the kid about how he was it was like a 30 year old spirit in a little boy's body <laughs> how she felt like she was working with a pro Okay, let's take look at comments before we delve into our... <laughs> Rainbow Freight likes my earrings. They're airheads. They're airheads. They look real. Oh, they wait, look like they, they have airheads. a real mini airhead. I know stuff. my camera's terrible, but it's airheads. <laughs> Isn't that great? Thank you so much. I have like a billion earrings, my God, and they're all on like... This is a sidebar again. I love sidebars, <laughs> so sorry. Watch this. Oh, God. I'm going to like knock down everything. Oh, oh look how cute. <laughs> My earring stand is bats. It's like a bat thing. These are some of my earrings. It's like decorations. Look at the Lunchables, guys. Lunchables. That is As hilarious. earrings. Here's Dwight with the pumpkin on his head. <laughs> That's going to be for Halloween. There's Winnie the Pooh and Rugrats and Beauty and the Beast. So funny. Michael. Oops. Prison Mike. Meat Wad. You got Prison Mike on there? Yeah, I got Prison Mike. Wait, let me show you. Pr prison Mike's up here. His face is very small. That is hilarious. There it is. Isn't that great? I love Prison Mike. The, the Dementors, they suck the soul out of you and it heights. <laughs> you remember that scene? I'm sorry, that was so ridiculous. But I love earrings, is the main point. And I like kitschy, like ridiculous earrings. See, there's a talk boy and like a Nickelodeon thing and Picard so and Rocco. Funny earrings. Thank you. Thank you. Halco says, I, I watched uh, horror movies. Uh, when I was a kid, and I'm fine, I think. I'm in <laughs> the too. same boat with you. I was telling Kelsey earlier before we started. Uh, my dad used to take me to this movie theater that some days during the week had like dollar movies or whatever. Oh, sorry. And they would have all these <laughs> B-horror movies. And some of them were like, I can't believe my dad took me to see <laughs> my, The things my dad took me to see, like he took me out of camp to see Anaconda. <laughs> he took me out of summer camp to see Anaconda. Oh, so I remember funny. that. Looking back, I rewatched it. 
the effects are terrible. Well, that's what I'm saying. There was a couple of movies I'd love to go back and rewatch because they were so frightening as a small yeah. kid, you know? I can't even remember. I mean, he also took me out of, like, legit school <laughs> to see the remakes of Star Wars, <laughs> like, the re-releases. Oh, God. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> I mean, thanks, Dad. I had awesome parents is the point. And I think people, you know, they can make their own decisions. Well, what parents I'm saying is parents decisions. need to make a decision based on what they know about their kid and what their kid can handle. Exactly. That's what I was saying. It should really be up I don't to think you should expose your children. Individual. Right. And that's where you have to do your research and figure that out, you know, kind of thing. And I did not censor you know, within reason, mm -hmm. you know, and I was, I'm a big proponent of having my kids read, you know, yeah. I just think the bit more you read, the better. And, um, but yeah, speaking of cool kids, part of the reason I'm giving it four stars is because that kid was cool, so awesome. Well, that then D Wallace's, um, performance and, you know, there were a lot of effects in it that were pretty good that we found out in the documentary. The documentary was... actually made me appreciate the mm -hmm. movie so much yeah. more. So I honestly, I know I keep touting the documentary, but I cannot recommend it enough because you see the camera set up. They literally had so many shots where they had to film inside the car. So they set up these elaborate rigs. And even they, the they had to cut the car apart and they had more than they one had car. more than one car. They had one where the camera is on top of the car. They also had one where a rig where they had to cut out the doors and stuff like stuff uh, like or the cut out the back and they had it spin around i forgot about that shot well, and also all the uh shooting they did in the editing because there are literally parts in the film where the dog where he's ramming into the car he really didn't ram into the car and it was actually a man in a dog suit that ran yeah. into the car so they, they, they when they actually had the dog run he ran through the car exactly and they cut it so the way they edited it, it made it look like he ran into the car but no dog was hurt and i liked how in the I think documentary is the guy to hit the car yes you know I like that. how in the documentary they really emphasize that no dogs were hurt. They used yes. like, so you told me a number of dogs, but in the documentary it was a big joke that everyone said there was different number of well, dogs. Well, and, and I've looked at different uh, things and there's all different numbers. So some people say it was eight dogs. D. Wallace said it was five dogs. It was even a 13 at one point. Yes. Yeah, so, so all these different mm -hmm. numbers of how many dogs were used for filming, but it was more than one is the point. Right. Okay, so director Lewis Teague, he also directed Cat's Eye, which mm -hmm. is a horror anthology. It's three stories. Two of them are from um, his books, um, like short stories, and one of them was written specifically for it. He was re recommended by Stephen King after um, Stephen King saw his film called Alligator. Mm -hmm. uh, the original director, Peter Medak, or Medak, uh, quit. Um, but and it was also how they kind of explained the, it documentary, the documentary or talked about how King originally wanted this guy, Lewis, but they got a different guy because the studio was like, No, we want this guy, this right. other guy, the guy who quit. And eventually the guy quit until so they called back Lewis and were like, You could do it again. Yes, Lewis but it was like, like yes. and they were had already started shooting. Yes. So he came in and basically had to fix quite a few things in it. Mm -hmm. Um, IMDB, I thought was generous. I mean, I think the ratings are good. Uh six out of ten. Not bad for uh, an older horror movie. Again, and horror Stephen King traditionally has lower ratings. So when you get above 50, it's pretty good for a horror movie or a right. movie that's considered and it horror. Is cons it is, I think, number 10. Well, look in the magazine towards the end. Of a good adaptation. Of good adaptation. Of his work, yeah. Rotten Tomatoes, 60%. Google users, 77 The original script was written by Stephen King. Right. However, it was long. And it was terrific. Uh, the director said it was terrific. But the when he, he wanted a new writer to come in, edit it down, kind of condense it a little bit and eliminate the subplots. So that's probably why we didn't get a lot of Charity and Joe Camber's story. That's why we didn't see where they actually went and got all that. That might be why we didn't get a lot of, you know, lovey-dovey with Cujo in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I really, I don't know. Um, but it's important to note that King changed the ending himself when he originally yes. wrote the screenplay. He changed the ending to be the ending we have in the movie. So they kept his changed ending and that told them, okay, he's open to other changes too then. Yes. So when they found out, okay, so as long as we pay respect to the novel, it's okay to change some things. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. they kind of well, started and that was changing that was more. part of Stephen King's regret. Yes. About killing Tad and the Yeah, book. so he changed it himself. So that's the so, first big change. Talking about cast, we've got Dee Wallace playing Donna Trenton. We know her from E.T. and The Howling. 
Uh, Danny, Pin is it Pintaro? I think so. Pintaro plays Tad uh, Trenton. He's actually 46 years old now. And he he's in the documentary speaking yes, as an adult. And he says, you know, there's people who say, oh, you must have been so scared and scarred on set. And he said, no, I was not traumatized. I was fascinated. It was an amazing place. He seems like he's a great memory. If he's yes. remembering back to yeah. when he well, was Well, I think it was like a big deal. A big well, deal. Well, I'm sure it made a big impression on him. And so that's why and he probably remembers People probably it. ask him a lot about that. You yeah. Know? So he talked really highly about his time on set with D Wallace and how his mom got close with D Wallace and all of that. So nothing but positivity mm -hmm. from, at least in this documentary, from the actor who played Tad. Yes. I mean, he was on a soap opera as the world turns from 82 to 85. He also starred in who's the boss from 84 to 92. And a lot of people recognize him from uh, that TV show as well. Uh, Daniel Hugh Ker Kelly plays Vic Trenton. He was a stage actor. He worked on the soap opera Ryan's Hope from 78 to 81. Cujo was his film debut. He was very nervous. Dee Wallace talks about that in the documentary as well. Um, because I guess, it was a big role you for know, him. You know, theater and television are very different. I've taken classes in both. There's just It's a very different art form especially soap operas versus movies too yeah soap operas is theatrical soap operas it that type of acting is over the top yes. and so to me i just don't think he fit as a good casting for the husband well, that's just my and, opinion well and also too not only that that how they directed him to i mean maybe they directed him to act that way or whatever he i just, just felt he was likable stiff. he yeah. wasn't he wasn't, he wasn't I kinda, in some and... ways see why donna hmm. In the movie, yeah. yeah. I mean, because he was I mean, very stern seeming. He just, I don't know. He, I don't know. He just didn't seem as loving. Yeah, like I loved the version of that character in the book. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah like I felt so bad for him because I was just too. like, why would you do that, Donna? Why? why would, yeah, like when you read Vic, you're like, why would she ever cheat on him? And she's even kind of puzzled. But the way I love how, like, there was only a few seconds. And he says this at one point in the book, like, there's only a few seconds where he thought, he was unsure if he wanted to continue, but he said he always wanted to stay with her. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, it was powerful yeah. when he says that to her near the end. So, I don't know. Their relationship is a lot better. And I think it's because of Vic portrayed better. And I do think she truly loves him. I just think she was struggling with her fears. and, and Right. And, I think know. she truly loves him, too. Again, but all of this is like, you can't show all this in the movie. So, I understand that. But it doesn't help that the guy who plays Vic in the movie is just... Not yeah. that personable, in my opinion. Yeah. That doesn't help anything. No, so that's part of that, you know. Film debut, et cetera, et cetera. Soap background. I think it all adds to it. Yes, I agree. Um, Steve Kemp was played by Christopher Stone. We talked about that. Married to Dee Wallace. Unfortunately died at 55 I do want to uh, talk about, I don't know if it's Cujo she's referencing. And I'm sorry because this is paraphrasing from memory from back in 2014. But she was telling this funny story about her and Christopher, her husband in real life, so D. Wallace and Christopher were on set of a movie. I wish I could remember the movie, but obviously they are in bed together in Cujo. They're not actively yes. having sex, but they she said that they joke together about having actual sex, like sneaking on like like having actual sex. Oh my god. <laughs> and they were like, let's try to do this and spice up everything. And then they got they chickened out and they were like, we can't do this. Yeah. And they could like, like they're gonna have their sex tape in an actual movie. Yeah, they were like, no, cut around it and like, you know, no one's really on set. I cannot remember the story, so please, like, I am paraphrasing to the max because I don't remember the the details of the story. But she said it with heart, and she said it with humor, and it was just a great story. Right. I wish you guys, <laughs> I wish I had it on video or something. I, I wish you guys could have been there. I've got to find an interview clip because I'm sure she's told this at multiple oh, conventions. Yeah, sure. But she was the coolest, not because of that story, but just the, her her aura. Yeah, it was wonderful. So that was a little story about her working with her husband and. She just really had a, a big fondness for her husband. Oh, it yes, came through, yes. you know, in her speech. Yeah, because she was married previously, but the marriage, I mean, she was, it was younger very and short. it was very short. And she didn't have a child right, with her previous right. husband. Basically, Christopher, the guy who played, you know, the affair guy in this movie, Steve Kemp, uh, he, he was the love of her life, yes. you know, in real life. Soul Christopher mate. Stone. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that was her her husband and he died. It's a bummer. And there was a period of time she was credited as D. Wallace Stone. Right. And actually yes. Wallace is her married name from the first. She husband, kept it, I guess, because she started she working right. under it. At right. First, Which uh, that's so. not an unusual thing. To, for women to do that because if that's how you're known by people it's like a little weird to right. try to i mean it's a name right and she could have just said it was her stage name uh Kual kalani kalani lee, lee plays charity camber 35 years as an actor 
theater, television, film. Very small role for the movie. Yes. Um, Ed Lauder plays Joe Camber, 40 years as an actor. He unfortunately died of cancer. Uh, did theater, TV, film. He was also a stand-up. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, I can't I imagine was, that. Which yeah. me either. And I've seen him in tons of things. He's like a good character actor. Mm -hmm. uh, Billy Jane, um, no relation to Thomas Jane, mm -hmm. uh, plays Brett Camber. The um, young boy. Yes, he was an act. He's an actor, film and television. He's also a director for music videos. I don't think he's been in anything recently. Like mostly his directing his music videos has been what he's been doing recently. Uh, Mills Watson plays Gary Pervier. Hated the adaptation of Gary. <laughs> they made him, one, so loud. He was always banging things. When Paul saw the movie, he's like, what's with this guy and wanting to make more noise? Because right. it disturbs Cujo, so it was right. very apparent. Anyway, we were like, why is he making all this noise? He's like literally banging stuff. He's got like a pile of cans in his backyard. I hated his house and yard. It was so messy and gross. <laughs> so in the book, he's not that gross. In the book, he's also nice and loves Cujo. Right. And isn't he a vet? Isn't he like a Vietnam veteran? He is, and that all comes across in the book. In the yeah, movie, he's a despicable, not. gross, loud. <laughs> right. except I am loud, too, but so sorry. But anyway, I did not like him in the movie. Now, Sandy Ward plays Sheriff Bannerman. And, okay, keep in mind when we talk about the Castle Rock, where uh, stories are in Castle Rock, Chef Ban Bannerman died. Sheriff. Sheriff. <laughs> Chef. He's flipping burgers <laughs> while, while police in the cooking. town. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Sheriff uh, Sheriff Bannerman dies and he's replaced by Sheriff Alan Pangborn. <laughs> and we get to meet him in the dark half mm -hmm. and then we'll meet him again in Needful Things. Oh. Okay, Michael Rooker plays uh, Sheriff Pangborn and the film adaptation of the dark half, but then Ed Harris is going to play him in Needful Things. So he's a big character. In he the is, universe. but that's the reason why you have Pangborn now in Castle Rock because Cujo kills Bannerman. Yes. I'm trying not to cough. Oh. So I'm paying attention, but I'm also not saying much. I feel like I have to cough again. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Go ahead, Kat. Okay. So, um, talking about Cujo, I was really sad that in the film, I like to watch the credits at the end uh, just to see information and, you know, all those people that work on it, they get their name in the credits. Except you know, Cujo little... didn't. Cujo did not. And I guess but... it's because he had 8,000 dogs playing Cujo. But in the documentary, they said Mo. Mo, Mo was, was the, the main, main dog. Yes, yes. Yes. So Mo was the main Cujo. Exactly. So they did have some animal wranglers. I didn't get their names, but Carl Miller was the one that was responsible for the action. He was the dog trainer. He literally wanted them to pick a different uh, breed of dog because they did not have any trained St. Bernards and they're too lovable and and in fact, in one scene in the movie, you can see before he attacks, what is it, Carl? Before he attacks the guy yeah. with the crazy lawn with the cans, he's wagging his tail. Yes, the dog. They, uh, even D. Wallace mentioned this, and I read this. They had to tie the dog's tails down because they would wag the whole time they had to do anything. And like a lot of times when they would do something, they would be going after a treat. So they were wagging. Or like, a I'm toy, gonna, a treat yeah, or a toy. A treat or a toy. So like, they're wagging because I'm going to get my toy or my treat. <laughs> and so they had to be like, we got to crop out the tail. So. <laughs> I thought that was really fun to, um, to know. And then he cast, now in this, they said he cast 10 dogs to play Cujo, but there was a range. Eight, 10, right. five. I've heard all and kinds of And all the dogs were trained to do different things. So what would happen is um, there are scenes in the attack scene parts of the car and stuff. Like when they were editing, there literally could have been five or six different dogs in that one sequence. In that one sequence. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's and what the DJ says, said. wasn't a guy playing Cujo most of the time? Some of the times. But there was some of the times they had a mechanical head. That was one thing. They had a mechanical head. They also had a dog suit and a man was in it. In fact, they even showed it in the documentary where the man crashes into the side. That was the man in the dog suit. They had a, a Labrador retriever on standby to put in the suat, but yes. they never had to use it. So they had another suit. It wasn't the same as the man's suit, of course. No. It was a dog suit, so <laughs> right. it looked like a St. Bernard dog, but a different breed of dog was supposed to go in it, but they ended up not using in it. In fact, the uh, fog scene, the fog scene, they were thinking about putting either the mechanical or using the man. No, they were actually going to use the a dog, dog in a, in a suit. St. And then they suit. decided it looked too dumb yeah they were like we're gonna use the real dog. right so they went ahead and used the real dog and, and I love actually the fog i think scene. it came out 
and, perfectly. And they used special type of like hardcore fog. And they said like there was fire trucks who came in at the very end of the scene because they saw the smoke lifting. Yeah. And they were like, what the hell? Something's on fire. Well, what was so ironic about that is he said it would get foggy normally. Yeah. And this was the one day it did not. So that's why they ended up having to do it. But thank God. Could you imagine if the firemen would have come in in the middle and ruined the scene? I know. They would have lost oh, so much. Here's another tidbit that you found out through your research. And I found out from seeing D. Wallace talk. And I thought I remembered it. So I asked you and you confirmed. Yes. So D. Wallace back in 2014 at the convention said, so it's supposed to be a really hot day. They're mm -hmm. exhausted, dehydrated. It was actually really cold during filming. And both D. Wallace and the actor who played the little boy, Tad, barely had any clothes on. In fact, oh, the little boy right. was, you know, didn't have a shirt on. So they, D. Wallace fought to get heaters in, the, put in the car in between takes. But because the heaters were so loud, they had to turn them off during filming. So D. Wallace is being sprayed with spray to look sweaty, but she's actually freezing cold. And so is the kid. And they're having to act like it's really hot. Mm -hmm. I think that's really awesome and such a great tidbit. Well, that and the fact that they wanted them to use other stuff like that glycerin kind of thing. Yeah, and she sweat. fought that too because she said bugs and stuff want to get in it even in the winter bugs she said were attracted it's really to it. she said it's really great and i will say another thing she said at the convention was this was one of the most harrowing filming experiences she ever had like it was so difficult the she was environment. treated for exhaustion for she was after. she talked about that and how mm -hmm. it was just so strenuous and it really affected her because it just it also took so much emotionally to get to that place where you're fearing for your child's life and she kind of she's the type of person who puts herself in the role well, like she said, but that she space. did say, despite all of that, uh, it being a challenging role, she did say that it was one of her favorites. Well, yeah. So, so she, she was, she thought it was exhausting, but she's proud of it. Well, she said that she at the says, convention Kuja too. was the hardest thing I've ever done, and it's the film I'm proudest of. Um, and it says D. Wallace, who had to be treated for exhaustion. And this is the picture in my magazine. Um, can y'all see that? Mm -hmm. And then Cujo up here too. Yeah. Yeah. So I. And that's I, out of this magazine. Again, another awesome gift that I refer to <laughs> all the time. I, I'm really glad like the few gifts I gave Kat have been really helpful for our King chats because it's a lot mm -hmm. of tidbits and extra information. And like Kat was saying, like, I, it's just fascinating to find this behind the scenes stuff out because I live for that type of thing. Right. So I love behind the scenes stuff. And Dee Wallace did convey that she was super proud of it. Just that it was exhausting. Right. Well, and believe it or not, it was a commercial success and it was one of the highest grossing movies of 1983. And it came out about the same time dead zone. And I think another Stephen King movie came oh, out. Really? Yes. Um, so I just, and it got King's stamp of approval and he was extremely happy with Dee Wallace's performance. He actually thinks she should have been nominated for an Oscar because was, he thought her, that she did so Her scenes so well. with the little boy and being attacked, incredible. Like once you, once I said that thing, I was like, when you asked me, well, who else would have played her part? I thought to myself, like, that was a stupid thing for me to say because no one else could have played her part. Like she did so right. fantastic during the dog attack scenes. I don't know how you guys feel about D Wallace and like while Cujo was attacking, do you think she was cast? Well, do you think she did a good job? Shout out your thoughts. Yeah. Cause it even says he calls the movie one of the best adaptations given the plot. He assumed this would be really difficult to make into a movie, but when he saw the end result, he felt they had did a terrific job. It's number 10. It actually beat out uh, 1408 and I believe Gerald's game. And Children of the Corn. And Children of the Corn. Which I love Children of the right. Corn. Uh, and it really, Children of the Corn is based off of like a story that's like four pages long. So Children of the Corn, I think is a Christine. great adaptation. So it was Dead Zone, Christine, and Cujo all came out within that year. Oh, okay. Okay. So the thing about it is out of the movies we've seen so far in the list, it beat out 1408 and... Uh, so the list Kat is referring to in this magazine, there's a list of best Stephen King adaptations from book or story to film. Mm -hmm. And so Cujo makes the list at number 10. So that is the list we are referencing. It's a list of good adaptations. There's also a list of bad ones. Cujo did not make the bad list. Well, and apparently right here, and this is Cujo. He is considered yeah. a villain, you know, one yeah. of the villains, which I hate that. So they profile the villains in this magazine as well. So here's Cujo's profile. And in this magazine, it says that he also appears in the Tommyknockers and the Dark Tower. So I'm wondering if... I'm not sure if that's related to the book or the movie, but when I looked up Tommy knockers in my encyclopedia, I had, it does not mention Cujo in there.
but I don't know. She's got a Stephen King encyclopedia, which references, it cross-references everything that, you know, is talked about in the universe. So her encyclopedia would say where Cujo right. is referenced in the other stories, but she's referencing that she did not see it in Tommy. Knockers. Yeah, I did not. So I'm almost wondering if it was the movie. Uh, yeah, maybe instead so. Of, instead of that. Um, I like we've talked about before. I think Joe Camber actually comes across much nicer in the movie. I do. So I Joe mean, Camber is the bad guy, the guy with the, um, the automobile, you know, fixer upper, the farm, the, the owner of Cujo, the, the mean man. He is much nicer in the film. I agree. In the movie, he is despicable. Right. I think they're well, you know, they're better developed in the book. Oh, obviously. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the interactions between Donna and Steve, just totally different. And then also to how the husband finds out about it's weird their yeah. affair is kind of strange and it's yeah, also kind of odd that because they show how he passes by and he sees the interaction with them but it's like i don't think he really even quite i mean he does say where were you and she kind of makes something up he starts to suspect right there but by the way um she had more chemistry with steve kemp or christopher yeah, stone yeah, and so because wow. i mean obviously she's married to him the chemistry with the affair was more than with her husband exactly so it almost exactly. made you be like is that why she was having an affair because she has no just, chemistry but i also them. thought it was kind her of strange husband, too that he's there i mean he he's there with her he sees broken stuff on the floor but he doesn't confront Steve. And I don't know if it's because the baby, you know, I say the baby, Tad's there and he doesn't want to say anything. But if I was the husband, I would have been following him out to his vehicle and having words like what's going on. Well, with in the book, it's so crazy that he writes that letter. Oh, so in, for those of you who haven't read the book, um, how he learns about the affair his wife is having is the guy sends a freaking letter and was like, I love your wife's birthmark. And I loved effing the shit out her, oh, of I her. I was terrible. like, oh my God. It is terrible. Like, I can't even. He's horrible. In the he book. is. He's very just gross yeah, and crude he is gross. and. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, he's disgusting. Yes. But a uh, fascinating character at the same time. Made for entertaining reading, in my opinion. But anyway, uh, you got here Cujo attack scenes. What do you want to say about that? Well, what I'm saying is that aspects that I think work well in the oh, film. Oh, yes, the attack that scenes. Really, yes, yes. You know, make the film awesome. Is that the performances again by Dee Wallace and Danny? Agree, Quintaro. agree. The cinematography, the camera work was done very well, and I'm just I I can't tout this documentary enough. I know I loved it before I even saw the documentary. I loved the scene in the movie where they're in the car and he wants the dad, and they do the revolving thing, and it gets faster and faster and faster and faster, and then it stops on Vic. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like he thinks something is wrong. Kind and of I thing. do think another thing mentioned in the documentary that I feel like we should point out a thing in the movie that does work. And it happens in the book, I believe too. She gets annoyed. Yes. D Wallace's character, Donna gets annoyed with her little boy. And when he says, I want my dad, she screams, all right. Which I'm saying I'm a parent. Okay. I have two boys of my own and there have been times where I've lost my shit momentarily and apologized after but it's realistic. sometimes when you're trying to figure something out you're, you're trying to think yes. of something calmly and you've got a child that's hysterical and they're freaking out you have to get their attention they're they're in their own fear mode at that point you've got to jolt them out of it so that you can think but i thought it was so powerful so that I in the documentary I no it's realistic it. like you said and what i love is in the documentary d wallace says that the filmmakers were worried about mm -hmm. keeping that in there they said the audience is going to hate you and it was actually the opposite effect it was because so d wallace fought to have it kept in there she said no believe me this will be realistic and she got letters people being like i've been there other moms mm -hmm. writing d wallace and said i loved your portrayal portrayal can never say that word in Cujo <laughs> that part where you yell all right I related to it I, I've been there so yes. to me that was very powerful I love that again like Kat said we cannot tout this documentary that I've linked in the description enough because it touched on that and it touched on so much more it touched on the cinematography that the cinematography was wonderful yes the the, the uh, fog scene to me was powerful I love the scene when Tad is in his room it remind it sent me back to childhood where you want to jump in your bed because you're afraid a that monster was so is well filmed. It because yeah. I'm telling you and they explain how they shot that which i thought was very fascinating yeah um the music 
The music was well done and it added to it, um, which I thought was great. It didn't come out like hokey or weird right. or too over the top or anything if like that. If you're interested in more about the movie, even though we talked a lot about what the documentary said, we still didn't cover everything. Check out the documentary. It's only about 40 minutes. Yeah, it's not well long. Worth it. All three opinion, parts. If yeah. you enjoy the movie. Um, there are, you know, major differences, and mm -hmm. I think it's because of time constraints. Uh, the movie moves much faster. Cujo's not given his moment to show he's a good dog, like in the book. Um, it focuses more on the Trenton family primarily, which I love the contrast of the two families. Mm, me too. Um, Donna has a good husband but cheats, you know, and Charity has an abusive husband and feels trapped. And to me, that's a class showing class, mm -hmm. the status of yes. your class oh, yes. um, in society. Um, Vic Trenton is, does not come across as caring or dynamic as in the book, um, especially his moments with Tad. Um, yeah, like he never seems overly loving with Tad. That's another problem I have. I don't like Especially the, the scenes with the monster words to get the monsters away. I know. I mean, what, I read stuff. it and then the audio narration, like the actor and the audio, that's part of it too, which made me really harsh on the dad because the audio narrator just had like a love in his voice when he voiced the lines where... Vic is talking to his son you could and he's, feel the affection, especially when he's saying the monster words. Mm -hmm. So you could feel the overwhelming love for Tad that Vic had in the book. And it's just not transferred to film. Mm -hmm. And it's, it could not be the fault of the actor. It could be, again, you don't have enough time. You don't have the lines written out, like, or it's the experience or it's a mix of mixture of all of it. Well, and it also could be, it was his film debut. And I mean, I am an actor, so I understand what it's like when you have to do your first you know, big thing, you know, you practice and you practice and you practice and you go on these auditions and you get your big break. And, you know, at the time you're, pra especially like in theater, you know, it's alive and mm -hmm. you don't want to make a mistake or whatever. So I get that. I understand that. But he had a lot of theater experience and he had a lot of experience on soap operas. Yeah, but it's just movie acting. So I feel like there's a more, there's a realism there because Whereas theater, you see the audience. I feel like I feel like you have to act more real. In, and I mean, he movie. goes on, and he has a really. I mean, he's still acting, I believe, today. And he I just don't went think did a lot of things. I just don't think he was cast really well. Which the director didn't have any choice of that. That yeah, was the, all done. Before, the director came on, and these people were already cast. But he lucked out with D. Wallace and the kid. Oh yeah. Um, like I said, I don't want to bash this guy too much. It's just, it could be a combination of things. Like I said, not just his fault. I kind of felt like the story, the film was more about Donna Trenton than anybody, whereas the book was more about the families and yes. the relationships. And Cujo's a part of it, but it's just, it's odd to me that they name everything after Cujo. And I guess in the book more so you get his point of view, but he's basically, I think he has to suffer and be sacrificed to save these families and make these relationships stronger. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Am I being sappy? Him and Ted have to be sacrificed. Yeah. It's very sad, yes. but yeah, um, it's just totally different in the movie. There's just not enough time to explore all of that. That's the problem. Now there, and that's what I put the silver lining is if there is such a thing, if you consider the circumstances, horrific deaths for Cujo, his victims and Tad, you know, with the dehydration, I really felt sorry for the sheriff. Although, no offense, in your training, maybe it's because you were in a small dial town. in first. Like, why didn't you call first? Yeah, and say I am out here. The Pinto's out here, and I don't know what's up. And then and there's blood on the window. Hello. Yeah. So that's, that would be the first I, thing. That's I did. a criticism for him in both. Okay, it was a natural consequence for him to get attacked and yeah. killed because. I don't think he, but I think it's that small town mentality. Yeah. And also too, he doesn't realize that there's a rabid dog out there. You know, he's, he, I know, he but didn't he, get a heads up. It's not like they had cell phones he back should, then. He should, he should suspect should, right. that there's yes. something out yeah. there that caused and the, the blood. minute he drove up and saw the Pinto, he should have called in and said, Hey, yeah. the Pinto is here. Can you send some backup? I'm going to start investigating. Yep. Kind of thing. Agree. Um, I think, and then we already talked about this, everything survives. I do think 
their marriage is, their marriage survives. I think they're going to have. I think it's kid. very clear their marriage survives in the book. I think Whereas so. in the movie, do you assume they? I do too because I think what happens, and I think that's they even talk about it. That's why they did the corny freeze frame. I at hate the that. End. That's the I hate one. That. That's a big but criticism. I hate, but I hate that, and a lot of movies do that. I mean, the Langoliers. What do they do? They're like jump up in the air <laughs> after they, they get out the airport, and it freezes. What else? Wasn't there another freeze in another one of the movies we have? Seen? Probably a Halloween or horror movie. Uh, not of Stephen King one, probably, but um, I can't remember. What about yeah. Dark Half? How did Dark Half? Did they have like a freeze frame? I can't remember. I can't remember either. They had a lot of fake birds <laughs> but, uh, and real birds, but yes. But, uh, but a lot, I find that like in some of these 80s and 90s movies, they like freeze frame it. I mean, slip away camp. Oh, yes. Sleep I mean, away how camp. can we forget that one? But that was a cool freeze. That was. That horrific. was a scary freeze. Yeah, very scary. Oh, but, but yes, I, um, I don't. I don't like the Cujo freeze, but I do think, and the director even kind of indicated this a little bit in the documentary that it freezes when they all touch and are reunited. So you kind of get the feeling that, that they're going to be okay, that they're going to be a unit. Now yeah. they're going to be continue on and survive. Now they eliminate Frank Dodd. Totally. That whole supernatural element. I was actually okay with that. I was okay with that. It'd be too much explaining for the movie. I think so. I think it would have made it too long, too confusing. So I was agreeing. I, I did think they actually say that um, Louis Teague is uh I saw somewhere when I was doing the research, um, the director he's considered an efficient and underrated director. Okay, so yes, yeah, I agree because this was really well made and it's a hard movie to make. They always say in Hollywood, the worst, like the hardest, not the worst, the hardest people to work with kids and animals. Yes, and he yes. works with both. Yeah, I mean, the movie is a tamer version of the book, except for Cujo, Donna, and Tad. Yeah. Um, I do have some funny observations. Go ahead. Did you have some funny things too? Well, <laughs> I mean, besides what I already kind of said about uh, some tidbits and stuff, but, oh, uh, I will say that it's not really funny, but I was freaked out from the kid's seiz fake seizure. Oh, yeah. And it's because the, the little boy had a real seizure when he was young. And so he was like, he told D. Wallace, I can do this. I think I know what a seizure looks like. And he like emulated a seizure and she was freaked out. Well, also too, he, he, he actually bit her. I know. And so her reactions to getting bit. He actually bit was, down. Yes. Yeah. So those were. Um, he actually bit down. I said, yeah. She. And yeah, that was crazy. So those were that. really sincerely a good response because she was actually. Well, my, one of my big things is, like I said, the funny observation, how D. Wallace calls in the town stud and says, no offense. <laughs> and then the loud noises. Those are my funny observations. What are yours? I think it's kind of funny that Vic goes and picks Tad up from camp and doesn't sign him out or even tells I, him to do me, like... me and Paul thought that too. Like, so this guy just comes up. You don't know if it's his dude and the kid runs away with him camp and you don't where's the kid like you know no one has to well that's what i'm saying exactly. like, doesn't, i mean because literally it would be different if they just cut away to it but he leaves his vehicle goes up there gets some and then leaves with them i yeah. thought that was crazy yeah. um i think the interactions between vic and steve are unrealistic especially when he catches them at the house also high heels really d wallace was gonna run to the house in high heels she wears high heels them off? Uh, that's what i was saying in the car i would have taken them off and i would have tried to smack Cujo in the eyes with the spike. I honestly thought the same thing. I, I would have used them as a weapon. What the crazy thing is, is I almost wonder if they they had filmed some of the scenes out of order and that's why she still had the shoes on. But at what point would you have taken them off? And also too, if you're going out there and you know that you might need to run, I would have been in tennis shoes, even going out there with my child, knowing I have a Pinto that bucks and might kill and all that stuff. Well, yeah. you have to walk. There was a possibility. Well, she said she had a possibility. So literally that was the stupidest wardrobe yeah, decision. I, I hated that. Yeah, me too. I thought that was so crazy. That is funny. a great observation. Um, I think the only sweet moment we have with Cujo, of course, you know, where he's chasing the little run bunny or whatever, and it's all in the meadow kind of thing. I don't think you sweet. automatically assume he's sweet, though, when he's chasing the bunny. To me, it's like, I wish there was more with Cujo. I also realize that I think in the movie, I, I think they realize a little more that something's going on with him earlier on in the book. But in the movie... Donna is the only one that notices he has this big bite on his nose. I know, and it's huge. How would no one notice that bite? Like Paul me, said that I would have been like, oh my God, what's wrong with your nose? You know, kind of thing. And um, Donna's more disgusted, not like what's on his nose. She was just more like, ew. Um, yeah, I, if I was the owner, I'd be like, what the hell happened to Cujo? But they just <laughs> ignore it. It's huge. It's like this big. I think the wardrobe when they played tennis was kind of funny too. 
Oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> the yeah, so, uh, yeah, the two guys are playing tennis together, and they're like short shorts and typical eighties. Yeah, and then I did think the ending was a little over the top and dramatic when she's in there trying to revive him with oh, the water like, and baby. stuff, and then Cujo, who we think is dead, jumps through the window. <laughs> Like, the director really? was like kind of <laughs> winking at the character in the doc, not the camera. The director was winking at the camera in the documentary, and he was like, you know, can't Cujo come back for one big scare? Like and that on. was the little supernatural element, yeah. I guess, because you yeah, know, yeah, <laughs> exactly. That was ridiculous. Yeah, like he was, he was dead. Yeah, and then all of a sudden he's coming. Back. But yes. in the mo- in the book, that happens too. He gets up again, right? And then she. Doesn't he come? Doesn't no, he? she stabs him with the part of the bat. I thought he kind of at one point looks like he's dead, and then he starts moving again. No, I thought she. I might be him misremembering because I did re- read this like weeks ago. Now at this point, no, I've read a ton this month, which I'm kind of glad that he didn't go out that way. I mean, it, in the movie, they couldn't yeah, have shown it. No, I I they even bad. made a point of not showing her hitting the dog. Yes, they cut away because they were worried about. People saying like yeah. you're hurting the dog, which she never did. No one ever hurt the no. dogs, so that was no. good that they 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 took the dog's safety. Now I seriously. did read somewhere, but I didn't read it anywhere, and they didn't mention it in the documentary. Two places mentioned that the main featured one, which would have been Mo, died, um, like either during the production or afterwards. It must have been afterwards, but not because of the production. One, no, one of them said it had gotten an infection of some kind, and then another one said bloat. But I have no way to corroborate That's that. That's sad. Yeah, but I don't have anything like, I, I'm like, wonder why they wouldn't have mentioned that in the documentary. So it couldn't have happened during production, right? I don't think so. I mean, I, I'm, they wouldn't necessarily want to mention that in the documentary. Yeah, so I don't know. You know, sometimes when you're looking things up, you know, you're Googling well, all this stuff. Well, Wikipedia, know. you can't always trust everything. Even IMDb, when people can make their own notes, you can't right. like literally believe every single thing. So who knows? But I feel like they, it seems like they took good care of the dogs or else oh, they yeah, wouldn't yeah, have had yeah, a person yeah. in a dog suit. Yeah, but I thought that was kind of a bummer. And I thought it was a bummer that, that is a Cujo bummer. wasn't. Um, Whoa. And the rest weren't yeah, credited. We're credited. Damn them. Credit like, the pups. Come on. come on. Well, I've had such a blast talking about this. Do you have any other tidbits or fun facts or observations? All I know is that this surprised me more than any other book we've read by Stephen King this year. And I year. didn't cry, but that's only because we didn't read any passages from the book. I know, but you were strong. I was strong. Yes. Because uh, she did cry when she told me, like, after she finished the book, she's like, I was crying. Oh, yeah. And funny. your husband was like, what is wrong with you? I know. Or- I'm like, yeah. Because it's one thing to cry, like, in a movie or whatever, but I cry in books all the time. Yeah, honestly. and he was all like, what's wrong I know, because he's just like, I-, I was like, I had to leave the room. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassed. <laughs> That's so sweet, though. You've got such a big heart. It is an impactful story. Honestly, if you haven't read the book, I totally recommend it. Thank you all so very much for watching. I know I never imagined when we said we were going to read Cujo, like, months and months ago, that we would have an hour and a half hour and 40 something minute chat about Cujo. well i really do think part of it is because there's more there's more to it there's it's not more. it's not on the surface at all daniel says thank you arlene says you guys are in good form tonight what a great show thank you guys thank you. rainbow fright says great stream y'all streams <laughs> <laughs> i can't even talk anyway great Ooh, stream y'all good country yeah i, I, I don't know what's wrong with me <laughs> check out rainbow frights channel by the way and katrina brown and plagued by visions and mr morning star and i hope i'm not forgetting anybody else oh kelly hooked on books yes. check out all of those wonderful channels like i can't say enough support other creators it's very important thanks halco appreciate you thanks all of you thank you so anybody much. anybody watching after the fact thank you so much we really broke down Cujo hardcore. I think we did. Next month we have short stories and who knows what that's going to be about because we've got three short stories Yeah. plus we have three movies. I'm going to get Kat <laughs> to take a picture with a lawnmower. So guys, next next <laughs> month uh, or yeah, next month, September, our official King Picks and make sure you watch the movies because we'll be talking about the movies. There'll be a lot of differences, I think, between the stories and movies. Oh, yeah. So The Lawnmower Man, The Mangler and Graveyard Shift. All three stories are coming from Night Shift, the and, collection. And, and based on my magazine here, um, I don't think they're going to be in the top. <laughs> no, all the movies are are notoriously considered bad movies, but I cannot we've wait. Been, we've been pretty lucky. <laughs> I'm uh, Langoliers was bad and I loved it and I cannot wait to see these bad movies. So join us to talk about some crappy films, but you know, good bad. Oh hey Christina, thank you for joining uh, us. Is that your thank friend? You. Yes. Oh, hey Christina, thank you. 
Thanks for watching. Appreciate you. Appreciate all of you once again. But for this time, Kat, that's it for us, right? Yes. Till next time, what can they do? Keep on killing it. Keep on killing it. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you again.